and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Apologies this week if my voice starts to sound hoarse or a little bit rough towards the end of the episode. I have been battling a spring cold, and while I have gained the upper hand in the past couple days, uh, an afternoon of recording is liable to wear on the old vocal cords just a little bit more than it usually does. So I do appreciate your forbearance this week. Now, we left off last week with King Richard the Lionheart being kidnapped on his way back from the Third Crusade. He had a little mishap with some of his ships. He was temporarily detained on an island by the Byzantine emperor, and when he snuck away from there, he was imprisoned by Duke Leopold of Austria, one of his old political rivals. And where we left off the story, that is where he was, right? He was in Duke Leopold's prison. Well, a few months later, in March of the year 1193, Duke Leopold sells Richard, and he sells Richard to none other than his liege lord, Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI. For this, he receives a large sum of money, several million dollars in today's value, and Henry is looking to make a profit on this. He's going to hold Richard hostage, and he is going to demand a ransom of 150,000 marks. Now, I did a little research on that, and 150,000 marks at the time uh, works out to 25,500 kilograms of silver. Now, that's $21 million at today's spot price, but if you dig a little bit deeper... Silver does inflate over time, much like cash, as more is mined, and if you take inflation into account, the price of Richard's ransom could be as much as about $3.3 billion. That is a true king's ransom. And this ransom or should I say this ransom demand, is good news and bad news for Richard's brother, John. All right, remember, John has been back at home all this time, slowly accumulating power, and any delay in Richard's return is good, right? It buys him more time to gain the throne in Richard's absence. But on the other hand, all of Richard's nobles now expect John to actually raise a ransom. So, as he's diverting funds from the royal treasury and engaging in other types of corruption, he's got to actually come up with some kind of money, or it's going to be obvious that he's not even trying to raise a ransom. And to make things a little bit more awkward for John, he isn't even technically actually in charge of Richard's empire while he's gone. Richard's lands, the lands of England and parts of modern-day France that make up the Angevin Empire, well, this territory is all temporarily run by a Regency Council, a bunch of senior nobles who are presumably trusted by Richard to run the country in his absence, and this Regency Council is led by none other than the venerable old lady Eleanor of Aquitaine, who once again makes an appearance in our story. She is John and Richard's mother, and she's certainly not going to just let John take over the kingdom. And moreover, the Regency Council under Eleanor is also actively trying to raise money for this ransom. Even as John is doing the same, and the kingdom is under a great deal of financial stress. Suspicion is everywhere amongst various nobles, 
accusations of treason are whispered and even spoken aloud between loyalists of John's and loyalists of the Regency Council. And during this time period, again, straying somewhat into the realm of myth, an outlawed knight like the legendary Robin Hood is a believable figure. In fact, there are several real-world examples from around this time period of knights or other nobles who are actually outlawed and roam the countryside uh, making their way as they can and trying to get on board with whatever side is likely to pardon them. And during this time, as a matter of fact, Nottinghamshire in England is one of Prince John's personal domains. It is a particular county that is under his direct control. And in this area, there is even a Hod family, maybe pronounced Hood, spelled H-O-D. And in 1225, a penalty was put in place for the property of a particular member of this family named Robert Hod, who well, you could see how that could be corrupted into Robin Hood. But that's a generation later, and it's kind of ancillary to our story anyway, but you can see where the roots of this myth comes from in this time period. Getting back to reality, Prince John faces another challenge in that he can't even really wish for Richard's death or pay for it to happen, as people often do in these times. See, as it stands, John is not the legal heir to the throne. Richard has named their mutual nephew, Arthur, the Duke of Brittany, as his heir. So if Richard dies in prison, it's probable that the nobles will all sign with Arthur as the new king. Right, so... John, on the one hand, would like for Richard to stay in prison for as long as possible, but he also needs him to stay alive. Now, I keep talking about the nobles. As if there are just like two blocks, right? John's people and Richard's people, or the Regency Council's people, right? But it's a little bit more complicated than that. Loyalty does not strictly fall across those lines, and it does not cut across national lines either, right? This is not an issue, at least at this time, of English nobles versus French nobles. This cuts across family lines, and it's because of something we haven't talked about much, and that is dynastic politics, this season of our show is about nationalism, even though that sometimes hasn't always been the explicit focus of each episode, but what we're seeing here is a different type of ideology altogether, a different way of organizing people. And it's a way of organizing people not by their origin necessarily, but by what individual is in charge of a piece of land? Well, how did we get there? This is not the ancient Western tradition of republicanism or democratic governance, right? Like the old Greek city-states. That tradition would see a revival in the Renaissance and, of course, later during the Enlightenment, really. But... This system is also not the sort of might-makes-right ethos of the Roman Empire or of the various barbarian tribes, right? The use of force is part of the dispute resolution mechanism in the feudal system, but the force is limited and constrained by a lot of rules that don't exist in uh, other systems. How did we end up with this sort of unique concoction that is European feudalism? Well, remember how we began the season, right? We began with the breakup of the Roman Empire. 
and we saw how the various Roman territories and governorships were taken over by Germanic warlords. And this Germanic warrior culture sort of meshed with the underlying uh, Roman division of territory and received a generous injection of Christianity. And then Charlemagne came around and exported that system back to Germany, and that's how we have basically all of Europe under this particular feudal system. And I say this particular system because there were other types of feudalism in history, Right? We had Japanese feudalism, which was similar in many ways, but it wasn't the same creature. This time period is before the age of nationalism. Right? Or at least it's before the age when nationalism was a major recognized force on the world stage. And that's why, in part, the Angevin Empire never became a real entity. This was a collection of separate lands, some in what we now call France, some in England, and these lands were ruled over, it just so happens, by a single king. But with the support of local nobles, kings could change in a heartbeat. And for this reason... For a king of such a large area, for them to maintain power, personal relationships and family dynamics are extremely important, right? more so than they are today. Right? Let's draw a brief comparison. Let's take a look at Richard the Lionheart's meeting with Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI. This is a good example of how these personal and family dynamics come into play. Here is how contemporary English monk and historian Roger of Wendover describes the meeting of these two men when Henry VI takes Richard into custody. He says, quote, The emperor for a long time cherished feelings of anger and malice against the king and did not even deign to receive him into his presence, or even speak to him. For he complained that the king had offended him and his friends in many things, and pretended that he had many charges against him. At length, after the interposition of friends from time to time, especially the abbot of Cluny and William the king's chancellor, the emperor called together his bishops, dukes, and knights, and ordered the king to be brought into his presence, and there accused him of many offenses before all of them. In the first place, to wit, that it was by Richard's advice and assistance that he, the emperor, had lost the kingdom of Sicily and Apulia, which of right belonged to him on the death of King William, and to obtain which he had collected a very large army, and spent an endless sum of money, he, the said king, having faithfully promised him his assistance to obtain that kingdom from Tancred. He next... With regard to the king of Cyprus, a relation of his own, accused Richard of having unjustly dethroned and imprisoned that monarch, and of having forcibly invaded his country, robbed his treasury, and sold the island to a foreigner. He next accused him of the death of the Marquis of Montferrat, his heir, asserting that it was owing to his treachery and machinations that that nobleman had been slain by the assassins, and that he had also sent the same people to slay his lord, the king of the French, with whom he had, during their pilgrimage, kept no faith in common as had been agreed and confirmed by oath between them. Lastly, he complained that he had at Jaffa thrown down into the dirt the flag of his relation, the Duke of Austria, in contempt of him, and had always insulted his Germans in the Holy Land by offensive words and conduct. After these and the like charges had been made by the Emperor, the English king at once stood forth in the midst of the assembly, and replying to the charges one by one, spoke so clearly and convincingly that he was looked upon with admiration and respect by all, and no suspicion of his being guilty of the offenses imputed to him any longer remained in the minds of his hearers. For he plainly proved the truth and order of his words by veritable assertions and likely argument of the case, 
so that he quashed all the charges and did not withhold the truth of what had happened. He firmly disavowed the accusation of treachery or of his being the plotter of any prince's murder, asserting that he would prove his innocence of such charges as the court of the emperor should decide. After he had for a long time pleaded before the emperor and his nobles, in answer to the charges most ably, the emperor, admiring his eloquence, rose, and sending for the king to come to him, he embraced him, and from that time behaved with kindness and leniency towards him, and treated him with the greatest familiarity. Unquote. In that image, or tableau, I guess, I picture Henry, the Holy Roman Emperor, as a mafia boss. He has all of his henchmen gathered, and then he gives Richard, a rival from another mafia family, a dressing down. You messed with my business. You messed with my family, right? Whatever words you want to put in his mouth in a 20th century context. And Richard stands his ground, and you know at the end of the day they both hug, but Richard is still his prisoner. Now, compare that to modern politicians, right? I mean, even dictators nowadays aren't engaged in politics quite on the personal familial level of these feudal dynasties. Right? At the very least, they have to make concessions to modern realities, like business, for example. And those kinds of interests create constraints on family leadership that you don't see during this era. It's fascinating. And Prince John has not mastered this dynamic of dealing with personal relationships. Throughout his life, he seems to have very few loyal allies. Right? Most of the people who are supporting John during this time aren't necessarily looking out for his interests. They're looking out for their own power. And they see in John a leader who is more likely to benefit them, but there is no personal loyalty involved. And meanwhile, even as he sits in prison... Richard has the support of Eleanor and the Regency Council, as well as many loyal nobles throughout his realms. And during this time of Richard's imprisonment, civil war does indeed nearly break out. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, for instance, who was also Richard's Justicar, his representative in England, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury preemptively seizes two of John's English castles to prevent him from using them against Richard. Uh, English nobles in particular tend to be loyal to Richard at this time, and that's because of generational rivalries with some of the French nobles and because of the fact that, uh, for political reasons, John is an ally of Philip II of France. Right. He is willing to give up some of the Angevin French territories to Philip in exchange for Philip's support of him. And this is the one relationship that John actually does seem to cultivate. He tries to, at one point, have his marriage annulled and to marry Philip's sister Alice. Right, Remember the one that Richard had been engaged to and broken the engagement, the seed of much of Philip's hatred of Richard, uh, well, John is willing to marry this sister and to form a formal alliance with France, and this is a step too far for the Regency Council to accept. Eleanor steps in, she brokers a deal, and in this deal, John backs down from his promise to marry Alice. And in exchange, the Regency Council replaces Arthur, the nephew, with John as Richard's legal heir. So John is now the heir to the throne. And despite his promise to stop plotting against Richard, he continues plotting, he keeps diverting funds, and generally trying to accumulate power. 
And meanwhile, John's decision to renege now on this marriage to Alice, well, this enrages Philip, right? That one person who John had successfully cultivated a relationship with, well, now John's managed to tick him off too. And you can imagine Philip is very upset by this. This is now the second member of the Angevin dynasty to become engaged to Alice and then go back on the deal. And he invades Angevin Normandy in response. Meanwhile, Richard's treatment in prison, which was very good at the beginning, it grows steadily worse as his captors try to press him to raise the ransom, and eventually he is held in shackles. And on November 4th, 1194, after 14 months in prison, Richard is finally released, with most of the ransom having been paid. King Philip of France sends a letter to John that reads simply, Look to yourself. The devil is loose. On March 20th, a little over a month later, Richard lands in England alongside his mother Eleanor, who had gone to the Holy Roman Empire to meet him and return home with him. And three days later, he is ceremonially crowned King of England for a second time at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And as his first act upon reclaiming the kingship, Richard seizes John's castle at Nottinghamshire and demands that John personally come to him and apologize for his acts of rebellion. Well, instead of making nice, John flees across the English Channel to Normandy. And it is not until the next year, in May of 1195, that Richard catches up with him. See, at that point, Richard has put together an invasion force to retake his land that Philip had invaded. And while he is retaking some of this territory in Normandy, uh, he comes across John, and John falls at Richard's feet, begging for mercy. And Richard forgives him. He says, quote, Think no more of it, John. You are but a child, and were left to evil counselors. Your advisors shall pay for this. Now come and have something to eat. Unquote. Well, John is very lucky that family ties have saved him from Richard's wrath. And in the Robin Hood legend, this is the end of the story. King Richard has made his triumphant return. John is undeservingly forgiven, but for the good of the kingdom. And Robin and Marion are free to live happily ever after. But Richard's story goes on. And the rest of the tale is one of reconquest and revenge and of what happens to you if Richard wants revenge and you don't have those family ties to protect you. First off, Richard uses the power of religion to get revenge on Leopold of Austria, that duke who had imprisoned him and kidnapped him in the first place. Richard convinces Pope Celestine to excommunicate the Duke for imprisoning a fellow crusader. And understand what this means, right? This idea of excommunication in these days means that the Pope says, essentially, you are no longer a Christian. Which in European society means you cannot access church services, and that includes a lot of essential services like Marriages and burials, for instance, can't take advantage of those. And you lose public prestige as well, right? I mean, if you're the duke of a territory and you've been excommunicated, all of a sudden, a lot of your people and your underlings start thinking that maybe they would prefer a duke who was not excommunicated. And then maybe you just happen to 
have an unfortunate accident or lose your dukedom, right? And oh, by the way, you're going to hell when you die, if you believe in that sort of thing. So being excommunicated is kind of a big deal. And remember, these are very religious times. Roger of Wendover stops in the middle of the ongoing conflict between Richard and Philip to spend 20 pages talking about a random monk in England who has a vision of purgatory and convinces a bunch of people to go confess their sins before it's too late, right? And this is the kind of thing that the historians of the day seem to be most concerned about. Not this silly war. So excommunication in that kind of society is a big deal. And Richard goes further than just getting Leopold of Austria excommunicated. He also comes within a hair of getting Henry VI, the Holy Roman Emperor, excommunicated. But Henry gets out of it by offering the Pope some political concessions, and the Pope lets him slide with a stern warning. And meanwhile, Duke Leopold convinces the Pope to let him lead another crusade in order to receive absolution for his terrible sins. And the Pope agrees on the condition that Leopold also return his share of Richard's ransom and some English hostages that he's still holding. And Leopold agrees to all of this, but... In late 1194, he's still kind of dithering about returning the money and the hostages, and uh, he is, though, holding a tournament to hype up his crusade. And here's what Roger of Wendover says about what happens to Leopold. Quote, At length, he himself was struck by a dreadful divine visitation. For on St. Stephen's Day, as he was taking recreation on horseback with his attendants, the horse on which he rode kicked violently and inflicted an incurable wound with its foot on the leg of the rider. For immediately the leg and foot together turned black and rose to a swelling, which no physician's poulticing could reduce and the duke was most unbearably tortured by the infernal fire, as it is called, in addition to the swelling. At length, being unable to endure this torture, he ordered his foot to be amputated, he himself at the same time taking an axe, everyone else refusing with horror, but he did not by this escape the agonies of pain. For, by and by, his thigh with the rest of his body was eaten away by the same fire. At length, however, he acknowledged the wicked crime which he had committed out of malice against the king and his followers, and on the persuasion of the bishops who came to him, he gave up the hostages and the remainder of the money due for the ransom of the king, and gave his word that he would also return what he had received, and promised henceforward to be obedient to the judgment of the church. The bishops, on seeing him in such a state of misery and suffering, absolved him from the ban of excommunication, and admitted him to the communion of the faithful, after which he expired in dreadful agony. For a long while his body remained unburied, until it swarmed with horrible worms because his son refused to fulfill his father's command. But at length being forced to do so by his friends, he released the hostages and allowed them to return to their own country. Unquote. Wow, your excommunication gets lifted, and you still can't get a proper burial until your son lives up to all the terms. Yeah, and that's a pretty big deal. And what about Philip, the king of France, right? Richard's got a grudge against him, too. Well, Richard would spend the next four years fighting Philip in France, and... For the first two years, Philip seems to have had the upper hand. He had the loyalty of a number of the Norman nobles, for one thing, and he also had the initiative. He had 
already taken over a lot of Richard's territory, and Richard has to take it back. But a couple of things do change along the way. Two years into this long slog of a war, in 1197, Richard is able to successfully bribe Baldwin, the Count of Flanders, into switching sides. And without going too deep into the politics here, this loss of a powerful French ally helps to even the scales. Now, this is only one of many defections that happen over the course of the war, and defections happen in both directions. Uh, this war, if you get into the nitty-gritty of it, is almost like a soap opera. Again, you've got these personal and family elements, and you've got one guy switching sides because he's got a grudge against somebody else who just joined up with that side, and you've got you know, another guy who will refuse to fight with anybody because some other lord kidnapped his fiance. I mean, you could go as deep as you want into it and get ridiculous, but the loss of the Count of Flanders in particular is a major one for Philip, because this count is a particularly powerful one, and it helps to even the scales between the two sides. A year later, roughly, in 1198, Richard scores another victory. The Holy Roman Emperor, Henry VI, dies. And Richard's nephew, Otto IV, succeeds him. So now, Philip, on his eastern border, instead of dealing with a relatively friendly, if officially neutral, Henry VI, is dealing with a relatively unfriendly, if officially neutral, Otto IV. But that does change the equation for him. He can no longer count on not getting stabbed in the back at some point. And on September 27th of 1198, the end of that year, the final nail is driven into Philip's coffin. Richard takes him by surprise. His army catches Philip's army on the move and defeats him in open battle near the castle of Gizor. In the retreat, Philip's personal guard overloads a bridge. There are actually too many of them for it to hold, and it collapses and dumps them into a river. And... In the churn of men and horses, a whole bunch of people drown, and Philip himself has to be dragged out of the water by some friends so he doesn't drown. And eventually, though, he and some followers do make it to the castle, and they shut themselves up inside. By now, Richard has regained all of his lands that Philip had taken from him originally. Ironically, with the exception of the castle of Gizor. Well, Philip offers to give up all of his claims on all of Richard's land as long as he can keep that particular castle, like the one he's in. But Richard refuses. Uh, this is when he famously takes the motto, Dieu et mon droit, which means God and my right. Meaning... He has no superior but God. To hell with this vassal ship under Philip, that's over. And he is not going to accept anything less than what he is entitled to, all of his land. But all of this may just be bluster, because in reality, after four years of fighting, both sides need a rest, both sides are experiencing some internal turmoil because some of Richard's lords and some of Philip's lords are not too happy about being at war for this long, and ultimately Richard and Philip agree on a five-year truce during which both sides will accept the status quo. And 
Richard will be proved wise for agreeing to a truce. See, almost immediately after peace breaks out, some of his barons would revolt in Poitou, which is an area in the Duchy of Aquitaine in southwest France, which is, if you recall, Richard's original heartland, right? the Duchy of Aquitaine, which he inherited from his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who gave it to him, right? These people there are revolting. And Richard, as you may expect, would lead a vigorous assault. He would largely suppress the rebellion within just a few months, but on March 26, 1199, while besieging a particular castle in Poitou, Richard would be shot in the shoulder by a crossbowman on the castle wall. A tinge of irony here, given Richard's earlier penchant for shooting other people off of walls with a crossbow. And while the wound is apparently minor, it would soon turn gangrenous. And this is how Roger of Wendover describes the course of events. Quote, In the same year, after the truce had been arranged between Philip and Richard, the kings of France and England, the latter king turned his arms against some of the rebel barons of Poitou, and carrying fire and sword into their cities and towns, cut down their vineyards and orchards, and slew some of his enemies without pity. At length, he arrived in the Duchy of Aquitaine, and laid siege to the castle of Chains in the Limousin, where, on the 26th of March, he was wounded by one Peter Basilii with a poisoned weapon, as was said. But of this wound he thought nothing. At length, in the twelve days in which he survived, he fiercely attacked and took the castle, and committing the knights and their followers to close imprisonment, put his own followers in the castle, at the same time strengthening the fortifications. But the wound which he had received at this place, having been all this time unattended to, began to swell, and a sort of blackness, overspreading the place of the wound, mixed with the swelling, and caused him intolerable pain. At length, when he perceived that his danger was imminent, the king prepared for his end by contrition of heart, by pure verbal confession, and by the communion of the body and blood of our Lord. He forgave the author of his death, namely Peter, who had wounded him, and ordered him to be released from his chains and to depart. He ordered his body to be buried at Fontevraud near the feet of his father, whose destroyer he confessed himself to be, and he bequeathed his invincible heart to the church of Rouen, his entrails he ordered to be buried in the church at the above-named castle, thus giving them as a present to the inhabitants of Poitou. To some of his intimate followers, he, under a promise of secrecy, revealed his reasons for making such a distribution of his body. For the reason above assigned, he gave his body to his father. He sent his heart as a present to the inhabitants of Rouen, on account of the incomparable fidelity which he had always experienced in them. But to the inhabitants of Poitou, for their known treachery, he left his entrails, not considering them worthy of any other part of him. After he had spoken thus, the swelling suddenly reached the parts about his heart. And on Tuesday the 6th of April, this warlike man gave up his spirit at the above-mentioned castle, after reigning nine years and a half. He was buried, according to his orders whilst living, at Frontevraud, and with him, in the opinion of many, were buried alike the pride and honor of the chivalry of the West. Of his death and burial, someone has published the following epitaph. His entrails given to Poitou lie buried near to Fort Chaloux. His body lies entombed below a marble slab at Fontevraud. And Neustria, thou hast thy part, the unconquerable hero's heart. And thus, through cities three are spread the ashes of the mighty dead. But this 
a funeral cannot be. Instead of one, this king has three. Unquote. Upon Richard's death, as upon the death of his rival Saladin, his patchwork empire almost immediately splits apart. Most of the nobles, at least for now, stand behind John, John who was named the rightful heir not just by the Regency Council, but, by the way, Richard reaffirmed that. Yet some of the nobles are still backing this nephew Arthur for the throne, so almost immediately there is a civil war. And there is the threat of Philip and France still looming. But that has not gone away just because Richard died. Remember, John has now made an enemy of Philip, too. And as it turns out, the Angevin Empire, if there ever even was such a thing, will not survive John's reign. England and France will remain separate realms, despite the efforts of some of the future English kings, but that's another story. And this is not just a matter of French refusal to be conquered. Right? People often think of the Hundred Years' War, which happened later, where English kings were trying to enforce a claim in France, and the French heroically fought them off, but... That was later, and it was also a continuation of this story, and this story is as much a story of French independence as it is of the English nobility simply refusing to foot the bill for wars of conquest elsewhere. England, in large part, loses her continental holdings because the English nobles don't want to go through the trouble of holding on to them. This is reflected in Richard the Lionheart's complicated legacy. Right? On the one hand, he is a renowned warrior. He's one of the most successful crusaders. He's known as an honorable man. Many historians consider him sort of the paragon of the ideal of medieval European knighthood, right, and manliness and chivalry and all of those ideals, uh, he sort of exemplifies all of those things. And had he lived another 30 or 40 years, which is perfectly reasonable, well, who knows what he might have accomplished. But on the other hand, at least as it stands, at least with him dead in his 30s, well, it seems like Richard seems to have done very little to benefit his subjects. In England, in particular, Richard's reputation is tarnished because he spent almost all of his reign either on crusade or in France in foreign wars. Foreign wars because the people of this time do not see an Angevin empire. They see two different peoples under the same dynasty. Led by Richard, a king, a man who inherited this land, who never even spoke English. But even in the midst of the breakup, of the Angevin Empire, of Richard's lands. Even as this happens under John, some new ideas would be born. The idea of England as a particular place with a particular way of doing things the idea of an English nation. And that's why it's relevant. Ah, 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 ah. 
Hello again. It's Dan, and I'm here to ask for your help. See, we're trying to promote this show and get the word out to as many people as possible, so if you have a minute, please share on your favorite social media. Send a link to the episode or even to our website at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. If this is your first time listening to the show, don't miss a future episode. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, formerly iTunes, Google, Spotify, or just about any other service you want to listen to a podcast on. You can find an RSS link as well as a link to all these other services, again, at dantollerpodcast.com. If you want news on the latest episodes or anything that is upcoming in the world of relevant history, you can find us at Dan Toller Podcast on Twitter or at Dan Toller on Facebook. Finally, if you've got a few dollars and you'd like to provide some financial support to the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. Alternatively, you can also support the show at subscribestar.com. You can find us there at Relevant History. And for everything else, including links to interviews and my blog, which may or may not ever get updated, once again, Dan Toller Podcast, Dan T O L E R Podcast.com. Thanks for listening.